Um, we know there will be a, a news conference that Vladimir Zelensky is holding. Uh, because of security measures, I'm not allowed to tell you when or where, but we're expected to hear something. There was a message that uh, President Zelensky put out via Ukrainian television uh, last night about solidarity, about fighting to the very end, about guarding the country's independence and basically making sure that everything is done in order to bring uh, the best possible result for Ukraine. Let's now bring you uh, our guest uh, to talk more about the situation. Luke Harding is the Guardian journalist who was for many years in Moscow, but now here uh, in Ukraine. You have a book called Invasion, which is a great summary of the past 12 months. Uh, for you, Luke, what are your thoughts today? Um, actually, it's quite amazing to be standing here because if you go back 12 months, the, the mood in Kiev was one of fear and dread. And I was actually in this square uh, round about this time and it was completely deserted. There were queues of people trying to leave t towards Poland. The, the, the routes out west were choked. And there was an expectation, even at the highest levels of government, that, that Russian troops would probably, probably come into the capital, topple the government uh, and uh, kind of in install a, a pro-Russian administration. So the fact that Ukraine stands, Kiev stands, people stand, there are joggers over there running around with the Ukrainian flags, sh sh people walking their dogs, shows us that, that, that this war has not turned out the way that Vladimir Putin expected. How was it, do you think, a year ago that Zelensky said what he said, i.e. get back to business, don't stay in the bunker, get back to what you're meant to be doing? Uh, I, I think <clears throat> Zelensky, who, who, by the way, his poll ratings were slipping a year ago, has turned out to be an extraordinary war leader and uh, a sort of communicator of genius, fated everywhere from Paris to London uh, to Washington. I think the single uh, smartest thing he did, bravest thing he did, was to not flee. The expectation in Moscow is that, is that Zelensky would run away uh, to America, and of course he didn't. And he has really personified this fight back, this underdog struggle against the Russian army uh, and the Kremlin. The sense uh, today that there would be some kind of Russian uh, response, um, do you think that is the same kind of threat that we saw a year ago? Clearly things have changed. Well, uh, yes. I mean, war has become a kind of normal. I mean, it's sort of terrible normal in which we've seen 8 million people have, have fled in Europe's biggest conflict since 1945. We've seen about 8,000 civilians killed, flags planted just over there to, to victims of, of this conflict. But at the same time, life goes on. And, you know, Kiev functions. But, but I've just been around the front line. I mean, it's, we're talking about more than 1,000 kilometers where you have ruined villages, where you have people living without electricity and water, and you have the constant boom of artilleries and shells from across the fields. It's, it's a massive difference isn't it, between what is happening here in Kyiv and going back to what you're saying about the front line. Uh, Bakhmut, for instance, we were speaking to a soldier who's fresh from uh, Bakhmut. Uh, he was telling us uh, about the situation. He showed us uh, images on his mobile phone, which basically looked like the kind of thing you'd see in, in the First World War. What is happening there is, 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 is war at its worst. Y yeah, and it's interesting. I was um, on um, the front line in Zaporizhia in the south recently talking to a drone team. They, they call themselves Air Reconnaissance. And I was saying, this is David against Goliath. This is the biblical story. Uh, and this young man, Michael from Odessa, said, said yeah, you know, we, we are the small guy. They're the big guy. But he, but he added, he says, that the small guy knows some tricks. Uh, and I think their view is that, that smart will win this war. I mean, I mean the, the Russians have so many troops. We've seen mobilization. We've seen 300,000 conscripts thrown into the battle. Savage fighting, as you say, around Bakhmut. But the hope... Uh, the belief is that with new Western tanks from France, from the UK, from other European countries, from the Americans, that the Ukrainians will be able to do a, a, another counteroffensive in the spring, possibly the late spring, similar to the ones that they did in the northeast and the south very successfully last autumn. In terms of uh, that issue of arms supply, I mean, clearly the message from Zelensky in Ukraine from the very start has been the same. We need arms, we need ammunition. The soldier from Bakhmut was telling us the same thing. The issue is, though, I suppose, that the Allies, the West, NATO, can't get that done quickly enough. Well, I mean, the, the politics is interesting. I mean, on the one hand, we've had an, a formidable anti-Kremlin uh, coalition. And again, uh, Putin, I think, thought that the West would roll over as, as it did in 2014 when he stole Crimea, an ex-Crimea. That hasn't happened. Joe Biden has just been here, the American president, earlier this week. So the coalition is holding up. But I, I think there's not, there's not sufficient clarity in European capitalists about what Ukrainian victory means. Does that mean 
getting back the East, uh, the territory lost since a year ago, or does it mean getting back everything, including Crimea, and restoring Ukraine's 1991 borders? And I actually think the West needs to kind of think about that a bit more and help the Ukrainians finish the job. We saw from Vladimir Putin, because it's tapping into your Moscow knowledge now, we yeah. saw earlier this week Vladimir Putin, Luzhniki Stadium in Moscow, a great sporting event. I've seen a football match there, wonderful thing. But what we saw from Putin was a big sort of self-promoting rally, being his biggest cheerleader, massive propaganda. What's the situation for him? Because clearly, if this result doesn't go here in Ukraine the way he wants it to go, does he face problems? Well, I, I mean, that's a very good question. I mean, Putin is 70 years old. He, he is comfortable with war. He, I mean, I watched his speech in, in Moscow. He was repeating the same anti-Western themes. Uh, it, it was a kind of a dress shot through with paranoia and conspiracy, saying Russia is waging a defensive war rather than a war of aggression. I mean, of course, that's not true. But I think he is he is prepared for a long war. Uh, and his, his calculation is that eventually, you know, the, the French voters, British voters, etc., will move on from the war in Ukraine and he will be able to win. But I, I do think that's delusional. I, I mean, here we are in Kiev, as we said. He couldn't take Kiev. He struggled in the east, um, it's stalemate. And uh, my sense is that actually Russian soldiers don't really want to fight. Luke Harding of The Guardian, your book, Invasion. Thank you very much for joining us and giving us your insight and analysis. From Maidan Square here in Kyiv, and you're back to Charles in the studio.